Hello and welcome to joining us at Games Beat 2020. We are so excited today to, def to have Joss Iquata and we're going to be discussing why gaming will be at the center of the future of entertainment universe and why Hollywood should be investing more, not less, into the space today. So um, I have the wonderful opportunity to moderate this talk with Josh because I have worked in the video game industry for 15 years. I have worked with Women in Games International for 12 years creating programs. Um, and I've also worked with multiple Hollywood and TV studios like with The Walking Dead, Saints and Sinners, which is the game I'm currently working on, Fox, Disney, Nickelodeon, etc. And I am also 100% a Jam City target demographic person. So um, Josh, thank you so much for joining us today. I was wondering if you could uh, just introduce yourself and tell us about your amazing past. I'd be happy to. So first of all, it's such a pleasure to, uh, to join you today, Amy. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. So thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, my background. So I'm co-founder and president of Jam City. We're one of the larger mobile entertainment companies in the world uh, with more than a billion game downloads and 20 million monthly users. Um, I'm, uh, we founded the company in 2010. We have over 700 employees. Um, we uh, were based in LA with studios in San Francisco, San Diego, Toronto, Bogota, Buenos Aires, uh, and now Berlin. Um, and uh, some of our top games include um, Harry Potter, Hogwarts Mystery, Cookie Jam, Disney Emoji Blitz, Panda Pop, um, and others. Uh, we've won some great awards like Facebook Game of the Year uh, and Best Game of the Year awards from uh, Google and Apple. And, uh, and what else? And about me before launching Jam City, I was a senior exec at Fox Entertainment Group where uh, I worked on a lot of TV projects, launched new networks, um, and then did a lot of digital work, uh, working on Hulu, um, acquiring MySpace. Uh, and then before that, I was at Viacom working on, on some of the MTV networks. So I've had a pretty, a pretty varied background, but I absolutely love being in, in mobile games now. Well, it sounds like you might know a thing or two about a thing or two. <laughs> so, Try. Um, <laughs> Great. So I'm excited to get started. And I'm just curious about, like you've mentioned in your background, um, that you were from Hollywood and film and TV. And then it sounds like you moved to video games when you founded Jam City. So why did you feel like that was the right move to make for you at that time? Yeah. Um, like what was question. happening 10 years ago that you were like, oh, <laughs> great opportunities. Um, for, first of all, coming out, of, coming out of college and out of business school, I was so excited to work in TV. I actually loved the space um, because really, I think for the last 40 years, TV's been arguably the best media experience. So tons of variety available at the push of a button, every possible kind of content available. It can be educational, sports, drama, comedy. Um, and it was easy enough to consume that there were huge network effects. There was the water cooler effect. So you could assume your friends may be watching the same big popular show at the same time. And, and you know, that makes, that makes media consumption that much more fun. Um, I had always loved video games. I love that they're interactive and social uh, and immersive, but it was hard, it was hard to play games. So Usually you consume games in multi-hour sessions. It's inconvenient. You have to be plugged into a console at your house. Um, and then frankly, the content variety was pretty limited. There wasn't as much competition as there in, is now. Um, so uh, it was just inconvenient. And as a result, not enough people played uh, games. But I, mobile completely changed that. And 10 years ago when we founded the company, we looked to Japan, we looked to China, we saw how quickly mobile games were taking over. Um, and it was basically because of accessibility. Everyone had a console in their pocket. Um, so the access was just um, basically zero. It was even easier than turning on the television at your home. Also, the session lengths were great. These games were designed for five minute sessions instead of you know hours and hours. Um, and then there was incredible competition. So you know, there's thousands of new mobile games launched in the app store every day. Half the world now plays mobile games. We really saw that coming 10 years ago. And we said we wanted to be at the forefront of where media was going. And it felt like mobile games were coming very, very quickly. I agree. And like I said, I am your 
demographic exactly like i've worked in video games for 15 years but um i would say 95 percent of my gaming today is done in the mobile space um i don't know if it's because i'm a mom and i can't handle like a a long journey without a short save point because I got to go make sure someone's, you know, not killing themselves or doing something the kids do. Um, so I embrace it. And for a long time, it almost seemed like mobile gamers weren't involved in the whole like gaming world in general. So it seemed like it was a really brave move for you to be like, Hey, you guys are really missing out. Like this is where it's at. Um, and I've played several of y'all's games and I think you've done a really great job with not just taking one type of gameplay and like reskinning it for every single type of IP that you have. Everything seems very thoughtful and it's like you, you went gung ho and you went with quality. And that's what I really appreciate about Game City. I didn't uh, get a chance to tell you I'm a fangirl before we had this opportunity. <laughs> so excuse me if I'm fangirling out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. But like you, I have worked in the games industry in a long, for a long time, and I know that Hollywood has had a unique re um, relationship with us, right? Especially with mobile games, as it seems like it's been more of a marketing channel than a revenue stream for them. But it seems like people are really starting to change their minds about that with IP-driven games like Pokemon Go, uh, Marvel Contest of Champions, and of course, you know, Jam City's Harry Potter, um, Hogwarts Mystery. So what do you think about that? And about just the medium of games in general in the Hollywood and entertainment space. Yeah, I mean, to, so I'll take your first point uh, first, which is, uh, I think it's yeah, such it a great point that like no, no one, very few people who play mobile games would ever call themselves a gamer. Like the mm -hmm. identity that comes with console gaming doesn't seem to come with mobile gaming. A lot of our most dedicated players that literally will put hours in every day if you asked them if they were a gamer, they'd say, of course, I'm not a gamer. What are you talking about? Yeah, I have some apps that I that I play with, but no, I'm not a gamer. So anyway, the the idea of what a gamer is, I think, is definitely evolving. I think games previously were, um, I hate to say it, but they tended to be pretty male-oriented. It t tended to be young males. Um, I think that's changed completely. We, we actually have at Jam City more female players than male players. Um, I don't think that's uncommon for other mobile game developers. Um, and so there's this, this democratization of games that's, um, I think, really, really changed the space um, for the better. It's not necessarily taking the place of console games. Console games are absolutely wonderful. But, you know, as it relates to Hollywood, everyone's playing games now and gaming and mobile games in particular are one of the best channels for fans to interact with their favorite characters and world. So ultimately, and you know, as I mentioned, I was in TV, I was in film, ultimately media is about consumer attention, right? So it's, it's at the core of what makes media companies succeed. If you don't have um, the focus of um, your fans and in our case players, um, you don't have anything. So Minutes of people's time is the ultimate currency and games are commanding an increasing share of consumer time and attention. So much more than films now, it's gonna exceed television shortly. So if you have a big IP, so let's, let's take, we have a, a Harry Potter game, for example, right? So um, players of our Harry Potter game spend months and months with Hagrid and Dumbledore and all their favorite characters versus just hours in each book or film. And I love, uh, I love the books, I love the films, but what better way to build on a franchise and expand it than to give fans the opportunity to really immerse themselves in that world for, for days and days or weeks and weeks or months and months in many, in many cases. So uh, stupid data points, but I love this stuff. So our players have logged <laughs> over 30 billion minutes of gameplay since the launch of the game uh, in 2018. So that means, you know, 50 million Quidditch matches, 2 billion spells, um, 2 million owl exams. It's just like people are living in this world. Uh, they're interacting with these characters. And if you ask me, if you're a franchise owner or a Hollywood studio, I just think it's a, it would be a huge missed opportunity if you didn't consider mobile games one of the best ways to reach out and interact with your, your core fans. Yeah, in, in this time of reaching out to find a little warmth in your day, I find that when I check in in my mobile games, um, it's like a little 
little bit of comfort. And if you have a franchise, like for example, a franchise I love, I love everything Disney, of course, because you know who doesn't. And um, then of course I also love the the Teen Titans. So like when you check in with those people, like once a day to kind of like do a little bit, I find it brings a little bit of comfort and it's almost like you're building a little bit of a relationship with a game. I don't know. Maybe I'm just really unhealthy about my gameplay. But um, like I, I do believe that if there's just some brands that I would literally buy everything that they do just because I want more interaction with those characters. I, I, I have to say, and, and we haven't talked about this publicly, but um, we've seen a particular um, surge in popularity of our IP driven games. I think there's like the familiarity of those Disney characters mm -hmm. and those, those, um, those Harry Potter characters. And we can go on and on. We have, we have tons of great games with familiar IPs and those games seems to be popping, seem to be popping even more than sort of our, uh, some of our newer in-house generated IP. Anyway, it's interesting. I think there's this, this return to nostalgia right now during these crazy days, you know? Absolutely. And then, so obviously a lot of IPs have come to video games. Um, but what do you think about IPs coming out of specifically the mobile market? Because that's what you're an expert in. Um, you know, obviously we've had the Sonic movie with such great reviews, but that's all console stuff. So what about the mobile space? Like, what do you think the next future is in that with the IP space exploding out of the mobile screen and onto other entertainment channels? You know, that that's a good question. I mean, I, I <laughs> I'm probably biased, but um, I, I really think games are a perfect source of IP. And it, you know, it's a, it's ten years ago, mobile gaming didn't did, didn't really even exist. So it's it's fresh in people's mind. And so the idea of competing with you know um, these classic Disney franchises or Marvel or Star Wars that have been around you know, in many cases, 20 or 30 or 40 years, it's, it's hard to even imagine. But, uh, you know, there's there's something about games. Actually, Matthew Ball wrote, wrote this really, really good article basically comparing uh, games and mobile games in particular to the golden age of comic books. And his point, which I think is just really insightful, is that in the 40s and the 50s, there were, you know, thousands and thousands of comic books they were pulpy, they were iterative, some were copying others. You wouldn't call them like a, you know, a bastion of, of literature or create, creativity, creativity. But out of that came these huge franchises that you know, are the foundation of a lot of our entertainment world right now, um, especially Disney and Marvel specifically. And so the idea that mobile games are similar in that way, they're, they're iterative, there are thousands produced every day. Some of them go viral and are huge hits. Others fall by the wayside. You know, all the thousand of the games that are launched every, new games that are launched every day can't be hit. There's something... Um, you know, survival, you know, we've had some success with our games. Um, and I think, I really truly believe that with a lot of our original IPs, there's real potential um, that they could be entertainment franchises of the future. And, and honestly, we're starting to make and design more of our games to have the, the depth and richness to potentially be those franchises of the future. So yeah, to answer your question, I, I think mobile games are, um, they could be one of the best future sources of IP that exist in the media landscape right now. Well, I enjoyed her. I'm sure you remember Cut the Rope. And then they started making little cartoons and my daughter really enjoyed those because they also had a whole you know, physics learning aspect to them. But I think some of the largest IP expansion that we saw was Angry Birds. You know, it was one of the first mobile games to kind of like explode and be like socks and diapers and like <laughs> literally everything under the sun was Angry Birds. I think they even have a theme park. Um, so, you know, that was one that, you know, did. So either what do you think is our next Angry Birds or like, what do you think that Angry Birds did that was so successful? And um, cause they were really one of the first. Yeah, I mean, they, they in some ways they were one of the first in some ways there, there have been other uh, games that have also broken through, but um, yeah, I think, I, Angry Birds 
by the way, I don't know, I, I don't know if I read a, a, an article about it or saw a documentary, but the, the concept started basically with the art and then they decided what sort of game of mechanic to wrap it around. And so I think they just had these wonderful characters, this immersive world. Um, it's a super basic casual game and it really shows you that even a casual puzzle game uh, can have the depth and richness to become something great, something that everyone uh, is familiar with and wants to play with. Um, I, you know, I, th I think there's uh, different arguments about what the right rollout strategy is for um, different uh, IPs and the right way to scale up to become a really big, successful franchise. Um, I, I think they were one of the first mobile games going to um, sort of traditional media. And, and I think they had maybe a few missteps. I thought the films were great. I think um, there were some other, some other areas they didn't have as much success. So, you know, I don't, I don't think the story's fully written on uh, Angry Birds necessarily. I, I think it'll be interesting to see how that franchise continues to evolve. But um, you're right, that's one of the biggest, most successful mobile games that's crossed over. But, you know, I always tell people that, um, I, I don't know if you know the biggest, most successful media franchise in the world, bigger than Star Wars, um, bigger than Marvel, bigger than classic Disney is actually Pokemon. And so mm -hmm. started out as a video game, um, has basically basically gone through every channel of uh, different types of video games and video games generations. There's tons of merchandise. Obviously, there's television and film. Um, but from a sheer revenue perspective, it's one of the biggest in the world. So, you know, I think, I think actually the idea of going from video games to traditional media is somewhat proven. And I just think it's going to take more time for more of these to break through, especially considering the amount of time people are spending with these franchises and these characters. And so, I think, you know, IPs like, Mario and Zelda, they're 40 years old, which is shocking. It, it mm -hmm. makes me feel dated. Um, Final Fantasy and Street Fighter are 30 years old. Roblox and Minecraft are 10 years old. I mean, these are gigantic franchises. What, you know, what will uh, video game franchises like Fortnite look like um, 10 years from now or five years from now? Can we expect to see them on other, on other channels and other platforms and in traditional media? I, you know, I expect we will. It's almost like the demographics of the fan base as they mature and switch to different types of media, like the company kind of follows in some ways, you know, um, I don't, I don't, it, it's really fun to see how different companies are interacting with their communities to, to interact and how they evolve. Um, who do you think is really doing it well right now? Uh, well, you know, well, we do a lot of work with, um, Warner Brothers and Disney, and um, they're amazing companies to work with. I mean, their franchises are 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 the best in the world, and and you know um, they really know their business. So uh, they've been fantastic. I think um, there's you know we worked with Fox for a long time, that is now part of um, uh, uh, Disney, um, and that team. Um, is absolutely astounding. We, we've done, I think, three or four games with them. They were always amazing to work with. Um, I think there's some smaller innovative folks like um, Skybound that have done really interesting stuff. They're doing some in-house development and they're also working with um, uh, some third-party studios. Amazing partners. Amazing, <laughs> amazing third-party studios like Skydance, yeah. yes. Yeah, and Skydance. <laughs> and Skydance is amazing too. Yeah, I mean, you guys are, are absolutely fantastic. So. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a variety of, of really, really great partners out there. I think everyone's sort of waking up to the fact that mobile games are a really, really uh, important um, uh, channel. And I, you know, I think it's only going to grow. Yeah. Um, so obviously, if, if the people who are watching these are running important studios, um, they're getting great advice. But let's think about some smaller media studios and some smaller IP people. Um, like what advice would you give to them to be like, oh, you know, like what you said with Angry Birds, it's like, it might not have started as a game, it started as some art. Um, how do you tell people of more modest means than Hollywood studios to think about their IP moving into like a mobile market as a possible vertical for them? Um, I think that's a great question. I, I think a lot of these traditional media businesses, they're so used to like 
obviously we have to have the best talent and we have to have the best director in our film. And then they think about mobile gaming. And sometimes I think they uh, look past treating it with sort of the same uh, seriousness and care. So um, I think and number budgets. one and budgets. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, that's a, huge, that, that's a real part of it, right? You can care about it all you want, but if you're not really putting budget behind it, but, you know, I think working with some of the most proven mobile gaming talent and companies makes a difference. Like it's not about getting the you know biggest minimum guarantee from a partner. It's about, you know, um, partners who have proven that they can make big, long lasting games. Live operations is more important than ever. You don't just put a game out. As you know, you continue to support it for years and years and years. So having a partner that you're going to be in there with and working with for a long time, it's really important who you choose. So be careful who you choose. Um, I think you got to have a really thoughtful slate strategy. I think um, uh, some companies historically have sort of pushed out as many games as they could and kind of took the revenue up front again in, in minimum guarantees and fees. Um, and uh, maybe they missed some opportunity of having a more nuanced or um, balanced strategy where games weren't being launched on top of each other. As a result, each one could be more successful. You could really get behind it with coordinated media um, and marketing. And so I think, you know, I think being smart about your slate strategy is important. I think, um, from like a prioritization standpoint, I think it's easy to say, I'm going to prioritize my film and make sure the game doesn't, being overly sensitive about the game stepping on toes of the film. And I think there's ways for them to uh, work together and, and give both platforms the opportunity to have some freedom and, and um, really make the most of their mediums. Um, yeah. And then what you said, I think having, you got to have a serious budget for both development and marketing and um, you shouldn't put it behind every single project. But if you have something that you think has the potential to become a billion dollar franchise, um, uh, Go for it. Don't, don't skip out on those budgets. <laughs> That's smart. Well, Josh, I could talk to you about this all day. And of course, um, we went over because I was just so excited about your insight. But I wanted to thank you so much for having this conversation with us today. And thank you for GameSpeak for having us. And um, that's pretty much it. I hope you had a great time, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.